Now, while many of you are dialing in, I guess that's an old term, as many of you are clicking in from across Canada, I'm speaking to you from Toronto, and I'd like to begin today's session by acknowledging the land where we live and work and recognizing our responsibilities and relationships where we are. As we are meeting virtually, I would encourage you to acknowledge the place where you occupy. I acknowledge that I am and that Maitri is on the ter traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by the Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Territory is also covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Ojibwe, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands and resources around the Great Lakes. Now let's move to today's session. And I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, our expert. Uh, whether sharing, leasing, or owning, nonprofits don't always think about the terms of their office space or in other words, their real estate. But there are many steps to consider before starting to negotiate a lease and an occupancy agreement. Which key professionals can guide an organization through the process? What sort of specific requirements are needed in terms of space and location? Are the relevant approvals in place? Office space is a basic part of most organizations, and so there's lots to consider. Our expert for today is George Georgiadis. He is a Loran Scholar from the class of 95. He was the first alumnus to sit on their board, and for a long time now, he's been in real estate. You will note from his bio, which is posted uh, in today's handout session, ha uh, session for the handout, he's remarkably well-educated. He has a BA from the Ivy Business School at Western, a master's in public administration from the Kennedy School at Harvard, and a master's of science in real estate and finance from the London School of Economics. After holding senior roles at McKinsey, he co-founded Lexington Park Real Estate, where he leads their team of investment, asset management, and development professionals. Today, he's going to share with us his five good ideas on how nonprofits can best prepare, manage, and use their office space. It is now my absolute pleasure to welcome George. George, over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, everybody, and thank you, Dimitri, for this opportunity. I think the topic you've chosen today is very timely. Uh, I know so many organizations that have gone back to the drawing board to revisit their space needs after we what we've all learned from COVID. And I think that today's discussion is also great because it dovetails really nicely with the previous five good ideas topic from 2021, where Nina Gupta from Gowling talks about the need for physical and hybrid workspaces. So I feel like our discussion today is a bit of a continuation of that conversation. We'll be starting from the point of view where organizations have actually identified their need for physical space and have decided that they will not be entirely remote. This is important. These types of real estate decisions are really important because lease costs form a substantial portion of a nonprofit's operating budget. In many cases, I'd say it represents the second largest overhead expense after talent. And the sad part is, is that organizations don't pay much attention to leasing decisions and don't allocate the required resources both internally or externally for a whole bunch of reasons likely because it's not their core business. Physical real estate function is most likely under-resourced or frankly doesn't exist in many organizations. And the biggest reason why um, we, you know, we think that organizations don't do a good job of this is the infrequent nature of the decision-making around real estate. Probably, you know, leases are, are, are probably negotiated once every three, five, seven, or 10 years. Albeit there are some short-term leases out there, and so you could be doing this a bit more frequently, but uh, the infrequent nature makes it very difficult for organizations to develop best practices and the real skills internally. You know, I liken this to playing golf. I'm not a very good golfer myself, but if I told you you could play golf, but you could only play every three, five or seven years once, how good would you be at this skill? Not very good. So the five ideas today that we're gonna discuss are five suggested steps in a nonprofit's leasing process. It's not rocket science, and the steps are actually very simple and logical, which is why I find it so, so difficult to watch tenants. Um, you know, as a landlord, I witness tenants every day rushing through their leasing decisions. They're entirely unprepared. 
um, not all of them, but but many of them, and they're and they're not necessarily understanding the seriousness of the decision they're about to make. And this often leads to some pretty serious, unfavorable long-term consequences and outcomes, not just for the tenant, but for the landlord also. So without belaboring this point, let's dive into the five steps of commercial leasing, which are intended to provide some help navigating an infrequent yet very crucial decision for many organizations. The first good idea or step one in the process is to be clear about your space needs. This is essentially problem definition. You know, what do most people say? Understanding the problem is usually half the solution. Absolutely true in this case. And every organization is different. And I think the old rules of thumb, just they don't apply anymore. For example, in the office market, it used to be that it was three or four per thousand. So what does that mean? That means that for every three or four employees an organization has, you'd normally require a thousand square feet of space. And I'm just not sure that's the case anymore. I've seen too many or so many transitions happen over the years. You know, it used to be that private offices were, were it, and then they moved from private offices to bullpen style. And now I see a lot of bullpens moving to some private offices, but mostly hoteling or shared spaces to allow for hybrid work. So as an organization, once you've determined your physical and or hybrid workspace model, I think you're going to need to answer four questions before securing space. I think the first is really what kind of space do you need? Do you need storefront retail, office space, industrial? What is it that you need? And in answering that question, you'll also then need to consider what's important. Do you need visibility, exposure, signage for your organization? Do you need parking for your employees and visitors? What are you storing? How much storage space would you need? Are you moving goods at a regular basis? And do you require loading docks and racking space? Uh, what are your accessibility requirements? Do you need ramps, elevators, security, and so on? These are all the types of things you're going to need to determine to, to, to figure out what type of space you need. Second question I think you have to answer is just how much space do you need? Right? And, and the answer should be expressed literally in square feet and then by category of use. So what do I mean by that? I mean, do you need private offices? Are you happy uh, with cubicles or shared desk space? How many meeting rooms do you need? Um, uh, do, you, do you need, uh, do you, know, do you make stuff on site? Do you need maker space, lab space? You'll need to identify how much of each type of space you'll need upfront. But you know, you can't just think about what you need today, right? You need to think about your space needs uh, in the context of growth. It's the most significantly overlooked issue, I think, uh, when, when tenants are, place, are, are, are space planning. They don't think about uh, whether the location that they're in or that they're selecting has the ability to accommodate more space if they need it. If, if the space you're in or you're selecting can't accommodate more space, then you likely need a shorter lease duration. And if the space you're seeking can accommodate, then you need to work with your landlord to be able to secure that additional space on, a, on an as-needed basis. And you can do that by negotiating a ROFR or, or a ROFO. Uh, you know, ROFR stands for right of first refusal or, or a ROFO stands for a right of first offer. And you'd try and negotiate those in your agreement so that as space comes up, the landlord comes to you first to determine whether you could grow into that space. And, and I think as a, a, you know, representing your organization, you just have to make sure the space you're selecting uh, uh, fits the growth aspirations that, that your organization has. I think the third question you're going to need to answer uh, is just how long do you need the space for? Pretty simple question. And, and, and this has two components. And I think the first part's really easy. It's do you need a short-term lease? You know, do you need a year? Do you need two? Do you need three? Do you need a medium term, kind of a three, five, seven year lease? Or do you need a long-term lease? And you'll have to articulate that need. Um, the second part's more interesting, I think, because uh, it really forces you to ask you know, why do you need the office space and how often are you actually going to use it? Um, we, we in our portfolio lease to a number of office uh, uh, tenants uh, and, we, and we also lease to a number of faith-based groups uh, and they only need the space evenings and weekends. And so as opposed to going out and leasing space that they're not going to really be using nine to five, they're subleasing from some of, some of our other tenants 
And so they're effectively time sharing space, right? And they're, and they're just sharing uh, the space based on the time of day and the day of the week. And it's a, it's a really great, great solution that saves uh, both the office tenant and the faith-based group uh, money. So the first question, or sorry, the fourth question or fourth consideration uh, that you need to ask yourself in, in determining your space needs is a geographic requirement. Do you have to be in the core of the city? Can you be on the periphery of the city? Is there a specific part of town that you absolutely need to be in? Um, does your location have to be close to transit? Uh, are there deal-breaking amenities that you have to have close by? These are all considerations that can drive decision-making. But, but uh, the last thing I'm going to say on this topic is no matter how big your budget or how big your organization is, um, you're going to need to have to prioritize these requirements. No tenant, unless you're building on spec to suit your organization, uh, no location is going to actually meet 100% of your needs. So you have to be prepared to let go of some of your requirements. And, and so what does that mean? I think you just, you've got to create the right priority list. I think doing that's absolutely critical. You know, set up your deal breakers, you, your absolute must-haves and some nice, ha nice to haves and be prepared to let some of those nice to haves go. So to ensure you get this right, you know, this being your, 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 your space needs and, and the determination of the space needs, I urge you to spend enough time at this stage with all of your various stakeholders involved to ensure the needs are identified very thoroughly, because this stage will set the foundation for all of the following steps. The second good idea or step two in the process really involves aligning with internal stakeholders and governance. So what's your internal procedure to get approval? Your team needs to secure in principle approval from the board or decision makers before approaching brokers or landlords. Essentially get your house in order before using external resources because you don't wanna waste others time. And when you're going through that process of securing approval in principle, you gotta be thoughtful about it, right? You've, you've gotta ensure that there uh, is flexibility in what you're seeking for approval. Because as you go out there to see space, like I said, you won't be able to find all your requirements. So ensure that you've, you've baked in flexibility in your budget, size and location in that approval. So that reapproval isn't required when you come across minor changes. And of course, you know, no, no approval uh, can be made uh, without keeping probably the biggest hurdle in mind, and that's generally center, centering around the budget, right? How much can you spend? Um, so you have to be clear and honest with your organization about the costs of securing real estate. Both the one-time upfront spend that you're going to need to outfit the space and, and or move into the space and get settled, as well as the ongoing annual gross rental costs. So for those of you that don't really, you know, you're not really familiar with all the, the rental costs and what goes into it, I just want to walk you, you through some of this. You're going to need to identify all of the costs of real estate for the budget, right? Like I said, including all the upfront one-time fit-out costs. But then you've got to figure out what's the ongoing base rent payment that I'm making. That base rent payment is effectively net rent or, or base rent. It has a couple of, of, of terms or, or minimum rent. Uh, but that's effectively the payment to the landlord. But in addition to that, there's something called, very name, uh, uh, aptly named, additional rent, which really pays for the expenses uh, uh, of the property. And that includes property taxes, utilities, repairs, maintenance, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you only care about how much in total will your annual rent be. But you have to be careful because unless you have a gross lease, which means there's one number you're paying and everything's included, you have to think through the additional rent or expenses. They're a big component of your rent and they can vary from year to year based on inflation and other factors. Um, I've seen tenants where they rent space, they might be paying 15 or $20 in base rent. Uh, they, 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 their additional rent is an additional $7 above that level. Uh, but within 12 or 24 months, their space gets reassessed, taxes go up, other costs increase, and, and they're now you know, paying not $7 a square foot for that additional rent payment, but 11. And that's you know, more than a 50% increase for them. And they didn't budget for it. And it puts them in a really tough spot afterward. So just keep in mind that when you're leasing in, in the commercial space, 
you have base rent and additional rent, and that additional rent can vary. Now, if you need help determining the budget, your broker should be engaged at this stage. You don't want to go through the whole process of budget approval and then only to figure out that you're not even close to what the costs are in the market. I think you'll lose credibility uh, probably with your broker, but you'll, you'll also definitely lose credibility with your board uh, when you're going in for that approval. Final comment on this idea, um, and I can't stress it enough, is start early, start early, start early. Give yourself plenty of time to do this. Set calendar reminder reminders, right, for one year in advance of your intended occupancy. Seems like a long time, but it's not. The more unique and specialized the requirements you have, the earlier you'll need to start. If you don't start early, you're going to lose leverage in negotiating, and that can severely limit your options for your organization. So the third good idea or the third step in the leasing process centers around getting the right advice. You know, you, you, you heard me talk about a broker. Uh, and so I think as you begin this search, you need to consider reaching out and working with specialists. And it's no different than any other aspect of your life, right? When you're sick, you go to the doctor. When uh, you have uh, a, a broken toilet, you, you, you seek out a plumber. Uh, so when you are looking for real estate, commercial real estate, you need to find a qualified commercial real estate broker. Um, I, I, I can't stress enough that you need to be represented. So they're not the only one you need to find. Obviously, there are a number of specialists that you're going to need or you might need, including a real estate broker. Uh, you're, you're going to need a lawyer, an urban planner. And, and, and the urban planners will help you with zoning and permitted uses for your, for your uh, organization. And, and you'll likely need a space planner. And if you're fitting out your own space, you may even need an architect, multiple engineers and mechanical electrical fields, and even a contractor. That assumes that the landlord's not doing your fit out for you. But effectively, the three critical consultants or specialists you're gonna need um, are the broker that we talked about, a lawyer, and a space planner. So you need to engage a, a real estate agent that specializes in commercial leasing, right? And commercial real estate agents each have their own specialty themselves, uh, office, retail, industrial, multi-residential. So you're going to want to find someone that focuses on the asset class you need. To be clear, the agent that helped you buy your home last year is definitely not the suit is not suitable for this purpose. You know, I see re, uh, residential real estate agents trying to do commercial deals, and generally they don't do well. So you've got to interview agents, and you know, and don't be afraid when interviewing them. Ask them how much commercial leasing have you done over the last twelve months, and and not talking about their firm, but but them, like they themselves, like how how, how many deals have they done? in the specific real estate type that you're seeking to lease. Thorough due diligence at this stage is absolutely required, right? Because they're going to be guiding and representing your organization throughout this process. You'll likely never personally interact with the landlord. The agent can effectively make or break your deal. And so trusting them is critical. So you need referrals from the right people. I think that's what's going to help to, to get comfortable around the person's expertise. The second outside advisor, and I'd probably consider to be probably the most important really, is engage a lawyer that specializes in commercial leasing. Again, the person who drafted your will should likely not be the person who helps you with your commercial lease. Use a legal specialist. This person should spend at least 50% of their time practicing commercial leasing law. And again, your leasing agent will be able to help you uh, with some good references. And I think this is probably a good time to just, I want to point out something here. Um, your broker is to be representing you and acting in your best interest. And of course, when you retain your lawyer, they're advocating on your behalf too. But I think it's really important to understand the incentives that each of those two advisors have. Your broker is incented to get a deal done because that's the only way they get paid. Your lawyer works generally hourly. And whether the deal gets done or not, they're there to safeguard your interests. So just keep that in mind as you navigate those relationships. Incentives are different between or among uh, the people that you're uh, retaining. The third critical advisor is a space planner. Um, and I'd say, you know, if 
you can engage a specialist or if it's a really small space, your agent, you know, good, capable commercial brokers could probably help you, particularly if it's like a small office, actually do the space planning with you. But for larger or more complicated spaces, you'd need a professional space planner to lay out your space and help you determine the square feet required. You might even want to hire a space planner when you're figuring out your needs and trying to break out you know, space by component, private offices versus bullpen versus shared desks. That might be helpful to, to engage that person at that time also. So I know you're probably thinking, wow, I've got to go hire all these outside people and it's going to be expensive. Uh, and the reality is uh, it is, you know, it is pretty expensive, but the exercise is worth every penny spent just from a pure risk management perspective for your organization. They specialize in these activities and they'd be able to identify exposures and risks that a typical tenant would easily miss. Good planners, lawyers, brokers can help effectively level the playing field, right? Because you can certainly bet that the landlord you're working with is likely sophisticated and they should be because real estate <clears throat> is their core business. And so, you know, using the golf analogy, if, if you're going to go out on that golf course every three, five, seven years, you can bet that your landlord's probably on the course every day. So you need to find some way to close that skill gap. The fourth idea um, that I want to discuss today, and it's the fourth step in the leasing process, it centers around being mindful as you negotiate your lease and you prepare for the occupancy of your unit. As I mentioned, you'll need the assistance of a lawyer to review all the lease documentation prior to signing. And this includes uh, an ATL, which is, stands for Agreement to Lease, or an LOI, which is a Letter of Interest. And these are often legally binding. So they're short form documents, but they can bind you and your organization into that, into that contract. And, and some people miss that because you still have to negotiate uh, a, a, and sign a long form of lease after you sign that binding ATL or LOI. So an ATL is essentially, essentially comprises you know, all the financial and legal terms at a high level summary. The broker needs to assist you on negotiating the financial terms. And um, they like to try and help you with some of the legal terms sometimes, but, but, but I think you're gonna really need your lawyer to help you negotiate those important legal uh, terms. Negotiating the ATL is, is almost always a prerequisite. Sometimes commercial landlords will go straight to lease, but other times they, they, they want that short form signed so that they can begin preparations. Um, if a tenant executes one of those, uh, like an ATL or an LOI and it's binding, without the consideration of all the terms, their lawyer may not be able to correct the issues at least negotiation times. And, and I wanna stress this, this is one of the biggest pitfalls I see tenants make. They rush, they're excited, they're working with their broker, they sign a binding ATL or LOI, then they engage their lawyer. And then it's too late in the process because you've already agreed to a number of things that you won't be able to change later, no matter how talented the lawyer uh, that you've selected is. So um, earlier, I also mentioned that one of the specialists you could hire is an urban planner. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I hire planners, I'd urge tenants to hire planners, but, you know, if you want to kind of narrow the number of consultants that you're using, um, you could um, uh, use a lawyer to help you determine whether the zoning allows for your particular use before you execute the lease. But I will say that it seems minor and trivial, but this is a very important thing to do. Make sure that you can actually operate your organization or your nonprofit in the space that you're leasing because some uses aren't permitted everywhere. And I've actually seen this happen before. A tenant negotiated an ATL, signed a lease, gave a deposit, got the keys, you know, and, and then realized they actually didn't have the right to operate their non or their business in the location they just leased. And it nearly bankrupted them because they didn't take the time to hire the right specialist and complete the appropriate diligence. Another area I'd like to caution you about um, 
is, is when you're negotiating the lease deal, there's so much focus on the actual, you know, face rate or the dollar value of the rent. And that's important, obviously, because it plays into your budget. But there are other terms of a lease that can be equally important. And I want to take a couple of minutes just to highlight some of them, like securing free rent from the landlord uh, and, and asking for tenant inducement allowances. Those are really critical. Landlords set aside money and time uh, in terms of free rent for tenants to uh, uh, take possession of their space, move in, fixture it, get settled. And so you want to try and secure as much free rent up front as you can. And your broker should be helping you with that as well as asking for a tenant inducement allowance that's commensurate with the type of space you're occupying. Um, the third thing to focus on, you know, in addition to the actual level of rent is thinking through, do I have sufficient renewal options? Like if I want to stay and need to stay in this location beyond my initial term, um, I have to ensure I have those renewal options at my disposal. Uh, the fourth and kind of fifth thing to consider here, they're more defensive in nature and they're more risk uh, mitigating factors. And that is depending on the leverage you think you have as a tenant, you know, if you're leasing a lot of space in a center and, and you happen to be a, a significant tenant there, it's always prudent to try and negotiate an option to terminate your lease. Now, of course, if the landlord's position is strong uh, or you are a small tenant compared to most of the others, yeah, the landlord's likely going to resist, but it's always nice to have that in mind. And finally, um, you have to ensure your ability to assign and sublease your space. This is a must in case your organization's financial or operating situation changes. Um, you, you know, I see tenants uh, take space uh, 12, 24, 36 months later into a five or a seven year deal. They realize they've outgrown the space. And if they didn't have the right to assign the space, or sublease the space to another tenant, they'd be effectively paying for two spaces because they've outgrown uh, their, their initial lease, their, their initial lease space, I should say. So once the negotiation is actually complete and you've, you know, you've executed the lease, um, you need to move immediately to begin preparations for your space. Engaging uh, an architect, if you need one, designer, contractor to help you prepare drawings and make permit submissions to municipalities, all that can take a really long time. And ideally, you want to obtain your permits before your lease commencement date actually begins. So you've identified your space needs. You um, have uh, figured out, you know, the people that you'd like to work with. You've, you've negotiated your um, lease deal, uh, and, and, and now you're kind of at this final step in the process, which centers around the period after occupancy. So once you take possession, your free rent period, um, you know, you, you've got to make sure you use that efficiently. Tenants usually underestimate the time it takes to have all those drawings and permits, as I mentioned, put in place. And all the planning, designing, engineering, all that stuff all needs to happen so that when you get possession, you can purely focus on the free rent period, right? And completing your actual tenant fit out during that free rent period. I, I've seen a tenant, I've actually had a, a tenant where we provided four months of gross free rent, which, you know, to fit out their storefront was actually very, very reasonable. Um, and they dragged their feet and dawdled and mismanaged their time and barely got their permits and applications submitted just before the end of the four months. Then by the time those permits get reviewed and the municipality turns around, you could be four, six, eight weeks. Um, and so now they're paying rent and they're not even in the space. They haven't even fitted out their space. Then they, they, you know, they stumble, they hit some, some issues with ordering equipment because of supply chain issues. And they literally wasted almost an entire year of rent. Uh, before they were actually able to finalize fitting out their space and moved in and, and were able to operate. And, and so you got to treat every day like it's costing you money because it really is. So once you've completed the fit out, uh, free ramp periods are done and you're, you're kind of in the space, you're comfortably settled into your space. I think it's important to create an executive summary of your lease agreement. So it's a short form explanation of all the relevant lease terms, right? And the summary is gonna lay out all your most important financial terms, all your most important non-financial terms. 
And it's going to allow your contract admin team, or if you don't have one, your, your accounting team to diarize important dates and obligations. So um, as we finish this last process, I just want to take a few minutes here and identify some of the financial terms you're going to want to summarize and, and keep close um, so that you can you know, reference them when you need them. Uh, first is the lease start and end dates. That's pretty, pretty basic stuff. Um, you're going to want to figure out your lease obligations and you want to want to communicate that to your accounting team. Uh, that's both the rates and the square feet. Or if it's a gross lease, you want to figure out what your monthly rental amount is. You're going to want to diarize your rent escalations and, 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 and the rates because often you'll sign a lease form and there are escalations baked in. Landlords want to ensure that their lease rates are keeping up with inflation. In today's world, that's very, very difficult to do given where inflation's at. But you're generally going to see lease rates escalate somewhere between 1% and 3% per annum, uh, assuming your landlord has negotiated that. So you want to make sure you're ready for those and that on those dates, your lease payments automatically increase so that you're not in default of your lease. Um, uh, additionally, I think you're going to need to, to diarize the number of renewals uh, and extension options you have, but more importantly, the dates by which these options need to be exercised. I'm going to give you an example a little later uh, to illustrate why this one is so critical. Um, some of the non-financial obligations, they include, you know, dates for delivering certificates of insurance, uh, copies of, of drawings and permits, uh, perhaps gross revenue reports, if, if, if that's something that your landlord negotiated and, and, and you're in that space, you're bringing rentings and retail space. Um, uh, and, and you also need to think through timelines for performing HVAC, fire, and life safety inspections. But, you know, why are these important? They're important because you don't want to uh, default on non um, uh, non financial items either, because uh, often some leases will have um, rights that you might have that might be um, no longer uh, in force because you actually went into some sort of default. And so it's important to capture not just the financial elements of the lease, but the non financial obligations and diarize those. So once your summary is complete and all the obligations and dates have been diarized, you can, of course, begin to enjoy the space uh, with your team and your stakeholders. And that's exactly why you wanted the space in the first place. But I will say, as time passes, your lease uh, term maturity is going to sneak up on you. Right. And so you've got to make sure you start, as I mentioned earlier, you got to start your renewal process early. As I mentioned, set a calendar reminder one year in advance. And you have to ensure that you don't miss your um, renewal windows, right? Uh, big dollars can be at stake. And you also have to ensure that you're actually submitting your renewal documents in the format that's specified in the lease to the notice address, specifically in the lease, because you don't want to miss out on a technicality. Um, and I, wa I want to give you an example, because I, again, I've seen this firsthand. I don't want to end on a really kind of a, a sad note here, but um, I've seen firsthand a major multinational manufacturer that invested, you know, tens of millions, over $50 million in a manufacturing facility. And their dedicated real estate group forgot to exercise their option to renew. And it cost them millions of dollars in rent increases. Because in the original lease they had uh, negotiated, they had pre-negotiated rent escalations. And once you miss that window to exercise, your lease comes due at the end of the term and it's no longer in force and effect. And so um, it was like they had to renegotiate with their landlord a renewal or frankly a new lease or an extension of their existing lease. Um, and they lost all leverage because even if they could uh, re-outfit another plant uh, and spend the 50 million all over again, uh, would they have had the time to do it? Uh, or would they have uh, uh, incurred significant business interruption? And so, like I said, I hate to end on that note, but uh, in conclusion, um, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you for listening to my thoughts on the steps of commercial leasing process. Uh, I hope it's been helpful. Um, I also want to finish my discussion today with some recognition from my team um, at Lexington. I want to thank Raza, Zeeshan, Kevin, Cassie, and Matt, uh, my broker, uh, for uh, providing feedback on the content and helping prepare the slides we use today. I appreciate uh, everybody's help.
So I believe I'm supposed to be turning it back over to Elizabeth, uh, where there may be some questions that we can answer in the chat. Again, really appreciate the time that everyone's taken today to listen to this, and I, I hope it's been beneficial. That was terrific. Uh, I, I just learned so much in, in 25 minutes. So thank you, George, and, and, uh, and to the whole team that you had working on pulling that together because it was so comprehensive and thoughtful. Um, we do already have one question in, in, the, in the queue, and I would just remind uh, participants that if you have a question, the Q&A box at the bottom is where you put the question. That's where I'll be looking for questions, not in the chat room. Um, but before I go to the question that's in the queue, I, I want to go back to your fourth slide. And the, the last point you made on it, you didn't speak to it, was don't negotiate for the sake of negotiating. Uh, start this relationship off on the right foot. And I think that that's, uh, I wonder if you can comment at all on if are there guardrails around what is too much negotiating, what is pushing too hard? I mean, I know it's an art. Um, probably you rely primarily on your broker for guidance on this, but is there is there anything that you want to sort of comment on around that? You know, as a tenant or as a landlord, you have to be self-aware, right? You've, you've got to understand what you bring to the table. Um, you know, if you're Walmart, <laughs> you have the ability to pretty much negotiate any term you like, and, and a, a landlord will swoon over you. If you are a thousand square foot occupant in a 250,000 square foot center, you pick your battles, right? You're going to pick the very few items that you need to, that you need to feel comfortable in, in negotiating. And I, I think it, it's, it's really that simple. It's, it's be self-aware and understand what leverage you have as you enter these negotiations. Um, and, and that'll determine it. And, and, and the tenants that frankly uh, aren't self-aware and uh, they think they're the anchor, yet they perhaps uh, are far from it uh, and want to negotiate every term. Often landlords would get kind of tired of dealing with them. I hate to say that. Uh, and they'll probably just end the negotiations there. Great. Um, and, and I've just got a question from my own team um, that said you mentioned a checklist that you put together for the session. Um, are you able to, to share that or comment on that a bit? Um, uh, absolutely, we can share that. And, um, uh, you know, I thanked a number of people at the end uh, there on my team, and they they put that checklist together. Um, as uh, it's, I think it's really important that uh, as you go through this, you, I mean, think about the dollar value and the magnitude of the lease. Um, the longer it is, like I, I look at contracts and I think, okay, you know, what's the severity of these things? What will it cost me and how long will it run? If it's a six month contract and it's for a couple thousand dollars, I probably don't get fussed about it. But leasing, particularly mid to longer term leases are, recur annually. And so the costs and the repercussions of getting into the wrong deal um, will just continue to recur and recur. And so why do I say this? I say this because you should treat it like the diligence of anything else that you do, right? Take it with severity. And I think that checklist, uh, I, you know, I, as, as comprehensive as it is, I think we could probably still add some, some more to it uh, to make it even more comprehensive, but treat it very seriously and do your due diligence and, and make sure you've chased down kind of all elements before you dive in. Right. So to the Q&A uh, box, at what stage should you hire the urban planner and the space planner? Are, and, and there's a couple of extra questions. Are all the specialists needed to work at the same time as a team? Do they connect? Do you coordinate it? And is this different in every case? I added, is this different in every case? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it is different in every case. Like if you, I don't think you need an urban planner if you're, if, if you're looking for plain office space and you're leasing in an office building, and you know that you don't have any other activity or other uses happening in that space, you're probably good with getting confirmation, getting your broker to get confirmation directly from the municipality that your use is acceptable there. Before you sign an agreement to lease, your lawyer probably will confirm, and you probably don't need an urban planner. Um, but with respect to space planning, again, it depends. Uh, if it's a, a large, complicated space, uh, you're going to need a space planner. If it's a smaller office location that you're seeking, perhaps, you know, one of the things I didn't mention, and I probably should have, uh, as I reflect on it now, is one of the things you could do is try and find ready built office space that's suitable to you. 
So you actually don't need to do any of that fit out, right? You don't need to kind of wreck and rebuild if you're going to assume a space that you think is very suitable that some other organization has, has, has left behind. Uh, and so, you know, in, in those scenarios, you, you wouldn't need a space planner either. Um, you know, would you have your broker communicate with your planner and your space planner and your lawyer? Absolutely, you can. Um, and it depends on how involved you need to be. But I will say it's, you know, because of the severity and, and the long-term nature of the contract and how much of your organization's budget it can consume, I think you want to hear feedback directly from each of your advisors and don't let someone else quarterback your advisors for you. Hear directly from each of them, but you can very easily, you know, have a Zoom call with all of them on or the ones that you particularly need at any moment. Yeah. I think when you were talking about sort of the expert team that you want to build around yourself, obviously that's going to be particular to the needs that you have. Um, I think you said, you you know, you're going to look for them and, and do you, is your broker a good source of, of referrals for things like space planners and urban planners and to sort of help you identify that expertise or do you seek that elsewhere? Like how do you seek that stuff out? I think your broker can refer you to those folks. I think, I think your broker can absolutely refer you to the right space planner. Uh, and if you needed uh, uh, an urban planner to 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 get through zoning issues or permitted uh, use issues, they can absolutely introduce you to those, those those folks. They can even give you referrals for lawyers. But you know, a referral is just that. I think you need to do your own diligence. Uh, and you know, there's a reason why I said you 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 want to hire a specialist. Uh, commercial leasing is ve- it's a very very specialized area, and uh, a generalist is. Will they do probably an okay job? Yeah, they might, but there are a lot of things that uh, a generalist lawyer uh, is going to miss. And so you're you're going to want to do your diligence on them directly. I actually think having the right lawyer that is deal oriented, meaning that they're not they're not in it just to kill the deal. They're really in it to protect you and make that deal happen. They're they're I believe you know uh, the most important person on your side because they're your they're your one man or one woman um, risk management team. Good point. Um, you referenced a faith based organization subleasing space for occasional weekend use evenings, and and I, I thought this was a really interesting element that you talked about this sort of hybrid use. And I think increasingly, as we as organizations are beginning to shift how they're doing their work and how often people come in, this is this is more of a, a reality. Um, what about two organizations on a hybrid format sharing it, sharing the lease, maybe uh, using the same office space on different days? Is this where the, are you seeing direction in the market going here? What are the pros and cons of having a joint split, split shared lease? Uh, does one become the primary? Are there sub? Like, how does how are you seeing some of this play out? Yeah, I mean, I think you're you're referencing like shared office space, right? I mean, there's you know like WeWork or some of the others Regis is out there in the marketplace doing that. I mean, they have a very different model. Like they they kind of wholesale their office space that they lease and then they break it up and retail it out to smaller players. But if you wanted to kind of do this more organically with just another organization that you think shares values with you and you'd be comfortable working with them, I think it's a great idea. You know, I, I think you know you you the landlord is probably going to want uh, both organizations to be on that lease and they'll probably want the, them to be joint and several, which means that they're, you know, you're, you're both responsible for the entire amount, regardless of who pays and who doesn't. And so you need to think through those things. And that's where I think finding good legal advice is really important. Mm-hmm. You're going to venture into that shared, um, that shared territory. But like I, I, I think if you can make it work and you can figure out the risk mitigation s- strategy appropriately, I think it's a smart idea. You know, you could probably even share reception, and you can sh- you can share certain common uh, area items. Um, and uh, and 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 you know, if you're if you're splitting it up in terms of days, you can prorata share your days. That you can make it work. Uh, it, it is complicated, and and. Uh, uh, but you've got to just have very clear and set boundaries. And and and. But I personally never, never been a landlord in that scenario yet. I've I've leased to an organization that's then subleased to another. So my tenant is the kind of the original tenant. Right. Um, someone asks, do you have any suggestions about what to consider when renewing a lease that's expiring later next year? What, what, does the checklist change? Does the or is it, 
you know, what are the considerations? Well, when you say later next year, so, so you're, so, you know, we're close to the end of 2022. So you're basically saying end of 2023, your lease is coming due and you're thinking about it. And, and I think uh, your lease document probably says you can't renew uh, the earliest you could renew. I'm guessing, you know, somewhere between 12 months or nine months and the latest is six months before your expiry date. That's typically what most commercial leases will say. Uh, and my advice to you is go to your landlord now. Don't, don't exercise your option, but say, hey, you know, we're starting to think about what, uh, what we're going to do next year and our space needs, and we're uncertain about them. And um, I'm wondering if we were to stay, what would that look like? And, and try and get uh, a rental rate from them if it's not already predetermined in your lease agreement. And maybe even ask, uh, what type of uh, tenant inducement would the landlord consider if I stayed? Now, again, it, you've got to be self-aware about your situation uh, as to whether you have leverage and whether you think the landlord, you know, maybe the landlord has a lot of vacancy and they very much want to keep you there. Um, and, and so I think you're going to want to think through those, but start early. And there's nothing wrong with asking, if we were to stay, what would it look like? And, and that gives you a good reference as to whether you'd be happy with that outcome or whether you should start searching somewhere else. Like if your landlord wanted to increase your rent 20 or 30%, because that's where market is, you might act actively choose to go somewhere else. Why not know early so that you don't use your leverage negotiating that new lease in that new location? Excellent point. Um, a lot of what you've talked about comes through having a good broker or real estate agent as sort of the that person that's going to really guide you through this. How do you pick that person? What, what, do, what are you looking for? Um, how do you know you're getting a good deal from them? What, what should your expectations be? What does that process of picking that person look like? Well, I think you want to go to um, a brokerage that has uh, got a good reputation. And, you know, there are some like national and international brokerages out there, and there are some regional ones. And the re it doesn't mean that the, the bigger ones are better than the regional ones. It, it really, that's not what it's about. It's about the individual. I select my broker based on whether I can, whether I truly believe they I can trust them. It's a trust-based relationship because they're advocating on your behalf and half the time you're not even there. Like you don't know what, what they're, how they're representing you and what they're saying. And so I think the most important thing to do there is, is find someone that's trustworthy. And, and, and I think having a positive reference from someone else that's gone through the experience and 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 uh, was happy with the outcome, referring that person is, is great. But again, it doesn't absolve you from doing your own diligence. Interview the specific agent that you're going to be working with and ask them how many deals they've done and you know how much, how, do they specialize in just commercial leasing or do they do sales? And what percentage of their business is sales versus leasing? Uh, and what type of leasing transactions? Like, I, you know, I was on the phone the other day with my broker and, and we were just talking about how many deals he'd completed this year. And, and so I, I, you know, I know that, and I know I didn't go into which ones were retail and which ones were office, but those are questions you can ask. And, and I think it's important. You just, you find the specialist, but at the end of the day, it's, it's all about trust. You can ask for references. Yes, absolutely. Um, somebody asks if you have any recommendations if you're dealing with a new landlord who has never rented before and is not using a broker. So now you, perhaps you've got less capacity on that side of the table. Uh, you know what? I Sorry, I just realized I didn't yeah. answer the last question fully. Uh, I think they asked about, about cost, um, uh, about fees, right? How do you know you're getting the right the, A good the right deal. Value? I, I think I, uh, the answer is um, the landlord goes out generally and gets their own their own broker. This is generally the way it works. And, and, and you can use that broker and that broker can represent both. I really? highly, uh, yes, uh, but I advise you to get your own broker mm -hmm. and, and have them purely advocate for you. Uh, and in that scenario, the landlord pays uh, all the fees. You don't pay a fee for your broker at all. The landlord pays the listing broker the listing broker then takes a portion of that fee uh, and pays the cooperating broker. The cooperating broker would be your broker. Okay. And so it doesn't really cost you anything, but you, like I said, it doesn't mean that you can just select anyone, do your diligence, get your right references, interview the person yourself, get comfortable that you can trust them. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're actually not paying them. 
Okay, that's that's an important point. Um, and so then to the next question, which is, um, if you're dealing with a new landlord who's not using a broker, perhaps mm -hmm. has is a bit greener on that side of the table, um, is there are there any recommendations about managing that? Well, um, you know, the first question that pops in my mind is if 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 that landlord's not if they aren't using a broker, um, will they pay for yours? Right, and, or will you have to be paying that broker? So if they're not, mm. then um, it, it it becomes difficult. I'm, I actually haven't seen that scenario very often, but um, I, you know, I guess you could, in theory avoid brokers altogether in that scenario right if they're unprepared to pay pay your broker to uh, to lease the space but uh again you would then probably want to move uh to negotiating an, an agreement to lease or or a lease uh with your lawyer directly with the landlord or the landlord's lawyer okay um we're we're our audiences are nonprofit organizations, and you've given examples from both for-profit, very you know, multinational corporations and their their deals. Um, are landlords more amenable to negotiating with nonprofits? Is that part of what can be in the negotiating space? You know, I, I think it. Uh, the answer, like most things in life, is that it depends. Uh, it, it really depends on the landlord's ESG strategy, right? Um, they they um they might have a particular affinity to uh, a certain cause and and they would be willing to look at your tenancy very differently than they would a for-profit tenancy um in my portfolio uh from my own personal experience i tend to charge um nonprofits uh market rent uh and what we would do though how uh you know recognizing that they're doing amazing work for the community uh, is that we would then take a portion of that rent and donate it back to them. And that allows us to maintain our market rents for the building. And of course, if we ever had to finance or do any financing, the rents are in place. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I, I've done that a number of times with uh, not-for-profit uh, or a variety of charities that uh, we lease space to. Right. Uh, we have time. There's one last question, and then I think we're out of time. This is a very specific one, and you may or may not have an answer for it. Uh, regarding specialists, uh, we're negotiating with a developer that has purchased a church and wants us to create a performance space in the sanctuary. We're seeking someone familiar with leases with developers for this very unique situation. Are there any suggestions? And if not specific suggestions, how do you go about finding that kind of expertise? So Elizabeth, could you clarify yeah. the, the, what specific expertise are we looking for? Someone seeking, someone familiar with leases with developers, I guess, for a uh, space that's being created for a specific purpose. So I guess that's a, that's all I've got from the question that's written down. Okay. Well, um, yeah, often you can lease space that's already built and you can go in there and, you know, kind of kick the tires, so to speak, and walk through the space and, and get to really understand what it looks like. Uh, but um, I've often leased space uh, to people in advance, to tenants in advance, where the building isn't even there, right? You, you stand there and, and it's an empty field uh, and you've leased the space. Now, th those lease agreements are, are, are trickier and they're more challenging and frankly, all the more reason why you need the absolute best specialists in that scenario, because there are so many unknowns and um, you need to account for so many things. I can give you a couple of examples to think about. Um, you, you have to ensure the handoff between what the developer is going to give you. What's, what's the condition of the space they're going to hand you when they're done building what it is they're building? That's one, and that's really important, right? Will it have an HVAC unit? Will the floor be leveled? Will it? Will the walls be completed and, and primed and ready for your tenant paint? Um, so setting up what the landlord's work looks like and the condition in which you're gonna receive the unit, critical in this scenario. But of course, we all know, and we've all experienced construction projects never get completed on time or on budget. And so you wanna, you wanna ensure you've got rolling start dates on that space. Um, but look, I think in this scenario, I'll never be able to explain all the things you need to think about. But like I say, the right broker uh, that that is used to doing these types of greenfield or major renovation or repurposing projects and the right commercial leasing lawyer will be your savior in this case. You need them. So do the homework and find the right 
the right expertise. Yes. Great. Um, George, this has been incredible. I have learned so much. I, I Most of my real estate uh, or, or building things have been very limited. So my, my world has just expanded and I feel like I want to go out and find new space, kind of, not really. <laughs> um, I want to thank you and your entire team for pulling this together. Incredibly informative and uh, it will live well on our website. Um, I want to also thank our audience for joining us today. I know that everyone is busy and so I really appreciate the time that you've taken to be with us.